Hey soccer fans, this is Nick reminding you to check out Sports Spider. If you're tired of searching multiple websites for sports news, SportsSpider.com has you covered. They collect the latest articles, videos, and podcasts from around the web and organize them by your favorite teams. If you want to stay as updated as possible on the Chicago Fire or any other team, hit the link in the description to check out SportsSpider.com. Hey soccer fans, welcome back to the Feed the Fire podcast. I am your host Nick and we are talking Chicago Fire versus New York Red Bulls preview this Saturday. It is going to be a very difficult match for the men in red, that would be the Chicago men in red, as they welcome the number four team in the Eastern Conference to their home stadium. I'm sure we're going to see some goals. Hopefully there's more for for the fire than there are for the visiting Red Bulls, but we're going to break it all down, give you who are the stats leaders, what to look for in this Red Bulls match, as well as my prediction with it. A little housekeeping up front. You can find me on social media at Glasshouse Soccer, and you can always email me at glasshousesoccer at gmail.com. Getting into our preview now right away. Midweek show, let's hit it hard. Let's take a look at the Red Bulls. Who is this opponent that the Chicago Fire are taking on? They are currently sitting fourth in the table on the Eastern Conference on 43 points. That's about 1.54 points per game after 28 games. 10 wins, double-digit wins, good for them. 5 losses and 13 draws. That really jumps out. 13 Draws by far the most in the Eastern Conference and only even with St. Louis, who also has 13 draws. I can't remember what the record is for number of draws in a season. I wonder if they're approaching it. I think the Chicago Fire might have actually been around that record uh, at some point as well over the last few years. But yeah, 10 wins, 5 losses, 13 draws, 44 goals for, 35 goals against, plus 9 goal differential. But their record really takes a turn if you look at the home and away splits. 7 wins, a loss, and 6 draws at home. 3 wins, 4 losses, 7 draws away. So they're about as likely to get a draw uh, as any other result, but much more likely to win at home. So, I don't know, maybe if you're a a gambling man, there's a little value on the draw here uh, in this match, or maybe for the Chicago Fire to to sneak a victory out here. But, you know, the moment I put money on anything, my predictions never come true. Anyway, and like I said last week, I thought the Fire would beat DC 2-1. Turns out it was DC with a 2-1 victory. So that's the basic stats of the New York Red Bulls here. And in their last five matches, though, they have three draws, one win, and one loss. So they're not in their best run of form, though we've got to take into account late season. We've got to take into account League's Cup break. So maybe the form guide isn't the best uh, measure of things at this moment. As a reminder, the last time these two teams met, back on April 13th, 2024, We ended up with a 0-0 draw. I think a big reason for that was that Red Bull's Andres Reyes ended up with a 42nd minute red card. So they were playing a man down the entire half and the Fire still could not find the back of the net with it. In that match, the Fire ended up with 9 shots and 3 shots on target after 650 passes. So the problem with the fire at that point was not knowing what to do with it in the final third and what has been the problem with the fire ever since, not knowing what to do with the ball in the final third. And we're going to talk uh or we're going to talk about some comments from Arno Suke and Frank Klopas and their midweek media availability about just that. Now, in the Red Bulls' last match, a 1-1 draw at home to Kansas City, they lined up in a 4-4-2 formation. You had their starting goalkeeper, Ryan Mira, from left to right, John Token, Sean Nealis, Andres Reyes, and Dylan Nealis. Yep, the Nealis brothers. Your midfielders from left to right, Cameron Harper, Ronald Doncor, Daniel Edelman, and Peter Stroud. And your strikers up top, Corey Burke. Everyone who knows Chicago knows Corey Burke. He's had eight goals in 10 games against the Fire in his career, going back to Philadelphia as well. Uh, And the other striker, Elias Manuel. So on the bench, they had available Ngoma Jr., Dante Von Zier, uh, Tanner Roseborough, 
Julian Hall, who in that game came on and found the uh, the goal for Red Bulls, the the late go ahead goal in the 89th, uh, and then uh, that is, or I'm sorry, not the go ahead, the late equalizer in the 89th. Uh, so they do have some options off the bench, bench as well as Dennis Jengar, uh, Dallas Odla, Felipe Carballo, Aiden O'Connor, and Mohamed Sofo. So not um, not the most well known MLS bench here, but with Red Bull, with that high intensity, high turnover, high pressing, counter-attacking style of play, as long as you know your role within the system, you can be an effective player. It doesn't matter how many years of experience or how many games uh, under that system you've had. But now let's take a look at the Red Bulls from a statistical standpoint here. Uh, who are their stats leaders? So Lewis Morgan is their leading goal scorer this season. He's on 12 goals for the season. Emil Forsberg and Elias Manuel on six goals. Cameron Harper on five. And then you have uh, Wiki Carmona with three. Julian Hall, Dante Von Zier with two. And then several other players with one goal. If you want to look at the assist leaders on the team, Dante Von Zier with nine, Elias Manuel, Lewis Morgan, and Dylan Nealis coming up from his defensive position, uh, all contributing with four assists. You have several players with three assists, Frankie Amaya, Willie Carmona, uh, Wiki Carmona, excuse me, Noah Isle, uh, Emil Forsberg, and then Sean Nealis got two and a handful of guys on one. So when it comes to the assists, when it comes to the setup, man, Dante Von Zier has been doing it, but they do know how to spread the ball around. And I think that does come from a result of their system where they do look for quick and direct counterattacks. This is not a possession team. This is not, we've got a number 10 who's going to control things. They will turn you over. They will look to counter quickly. And that is going to cause a lot of trouble for a Chicago Fire back line that struggles to maintain its shape and its compactness. And especially for a Chicago Fire team that plays so differently from defense to offense and has real difficulty transitioning between the two. We know that the Chicago Fire really don't have an offensive system or set or formation or style. They're either playing long balls up the wing or playing the ball to Gutierrez in the middle to try and dribble out and create something. Uh, so they tend to get pulled out of position uh, when they're trying to figure out something on offense. That makes it difficult to transition back into their defensive shape, whether it's a 4-4-2, whether it's a five-man back line with a, a compact central midfield area. Uh, it's going to be very hard, I think, for Brian Gutierrez to uh, have any time on the ball to create something as a result of the way Red Bulls play defense. I think they are going to be all over him and just say, go ahead, Go ahead, Chicago. Try those long balls over the top to Hugo Kuypers that haven't worked for you all season. We're going to shut down Gutierrez, and we're going to counterattack right down the middle. Whether you've got Gaston Jimenez or Kellen Acosta in the middle, we're going to attack right past them, right through them, and really put the pressure on your back line. And we have seen over the course of a season, when the Chicago Fire back line are doing the brunt of the defending, when they're the first line of defense as opposed to say a counter pressing striker or uh, a high line from your midfield they eventually will give up one or two goals they can't keep it up for the full 90 minutes and we'll need to see who's fit and ready to go for the fire back line there now as for the fire availability report at the time i'm recording this the league has not released the latest one but from last week chase gasper was out with a leg injury mauricio pineda was out with a leg injury fortunately for us then he got to sign some pre-game autographs for for the boys and for the other fans and kids who attended chicago fire camps over the summer uh and kutsius and lassiter were out for international duty though they are back and training with the team as far as the red bull players who were out last week it was a number of players goalkeeper carlos cornell on international duty noah isle on international duty forsberg out with a leg injury world mitchell with a knee injury lewis morgan international duty wiki carmona's out with a thigh kyle duncan was out with the, or sorry wiki carmona and kyle duncan were questionable with thigh and knee injuries respectively so we'll see if lewis morgan noah isle carlos cornell are back in the mix and fit after some transatlantic flights uh, and international duty there. 
something to keep an eye on uh, for this upcoming match. The other thing to keep an eye on here are the keys to the match as presented by the New York Red Bulls. I went over to their website and wanted to see what they were saying and how they're feeling coming into this game. And their first key to the match, it, they call it track record. And it starts with Corey Burke. As we mentioned, he got his first start of the season in their last match against Kansas City. And it was his first start for Red Bulls since July 15th of 2023. But that's not what they're worried about. They're happy that he's back starting fit. But he has 10 career appearances against the Fire and has scored 8 goals, including the last time we were at Soldier Field. Uh, so that is one of their keys to the match, Corey Burke. Second one, place and position. Uh, they highlight goalkeeper Carlos Cornell. And despite being out last week, he is one win shy of tying Tony Miola for second place in franchise history. Four wins by a goalkeeper with 48. So that goes back to the Metro Stars days before they were purchased and rebranded as the Red Bulls. Oh, rebranded Red Bulls. There's got to be a joke in there. There's a branding joke in there somewhere. Cowboy something. I don't know. Uh, actually, who, I wonder who would be the first. I probably should know that, but I'll have to look that up off air. Or if you want to look it up and tell me who's... Uh, Who's the number one winningest goalkeeper and in Metro Star Red Bull history? And finally, they say Hall Pass. Here's their third key to the match, highlighting young star Julian Hall. He got his second goal of the season and has seven or in their last match and has seven goals between the first team and Red Bulls 2. He's the first player 16 or younger in MLS to record a game time goal in the 80th minute or later in multiple matches. So Julian Hall, another player to look out for coming off the bench as a game changer. And we've talked about that with the fire, that when they bring in their subs, they need to bring in game changers, not just like for like subs, not just guys who can run out fresh legs, guys that are going to change the match in favor of the Chicago Fire. Whether that is coming in and putting in a crushing defensive play as soon as you get on the pitch, uh, except Freddie Navarro, don't do anything stupid and pick up a, a yellow card immediately or get yourself uh, thrown out with a red card, but still put in a hard physical defensive challenge. We know the Red Bulls like to play physical, this game can get chippy. Or are you going to come in and start uh, playing much more possession oriented? Are you going to start getting the ball to a striker who maybe who comes in, who's going to get a few shots off and maybe make that Red Bulls defense play just a few yards deeper to open up a little bit more space, say for Gutierrez or whoever else is bringing the ball up in the middle. So that's the Red Bulls have that sub in Julian Hall. Do the fire have that sub on their bench? And who are we going to see? So those were the keys to the game as presented by the Red Bull side of things. For the Chicago Fire's key to the game, it is going to have to be control. It is going to have to be poise. It is going to have to be decision making. To borrow a phrase from Arno Suke and from head coach Frank Lopas, they both repeated that phrase in their midweek media availability session. And it, it the... Chicago Fire have lacked that decision making. Uh, when they make a decision, is it the best one? And then they just don't make decisions. The ball just keeps moving laterally and backwards. And there, it's one thing to want to maintain possession and to try and stretch this Red Bull team out and then exploit the space uh, that players vacate as they're pushing forward, as they're pressing hard. Uh, but the Fire need to be making good decisions and we didn't see that in the dc game we saw a lot of bad passes we saw a lot of bad first touches that went immediately to dc uh we saw them not knowing where their players were around the pitch either for those quick outlets so the fire essentially everything the fire did wrong a week ago they've got to correct it if they're going to have a chance against this red bull team so i guess that kind of tells you where i'm leaning when it comes to my prediction here but we're not going to get into the prediction yet we're going to take a quick water break here halftime for this short preview episode where we recognize our sponsor skira icelandic spring water icelandic for clear skira water comes from a spring in a government protected nature preserve in iceland with naturally low mineral content this isn't your average water clearly pun intended it's one of the best and you can get a bottle of skira icelandic water in your local 7-Eleven, and gosh knows I need to go get a couple bottles. We had uh, my son's soccer practice 
yesterday. It's nice to watch them play back to back, my kindergartner and my third grader. Uh, my kindergartner, he's got a nice strong kick. He just wants to run and play and screw around with his buddies and score goals. Hard to keep him under control, so I had to jump in and help out a little bit in the kindergarten practice, uh, but then also with the third grade practice. It's so much fun seeing these kids, you know, run drills and play and want to and want to learn. But at the same time, uh, like 10 of the 14 kids all go to school together. So they see each other all day in a very controlled and strict, no screwing around environment. And then they all come to soccer practice and it's like free for all. Everybody, let's go. Uh, there was a couple water fights that broke out. There were a couple times when it was uh, shirts for skins that became skins for skins. <laughs> little third graders having fun running around their shirts off. Uh, so my voice is a little scratchy here. Moral of the story, I need to go and restock on some Skira Icelandic spring water. Now getting into the second half of the show, let's recap some of that midweek media availability session uh, with Arnaud Suke and Frank Lopez and see if we can glean anything as to how the Fire are going to play in this upcoming match. Now I listened to Suke's clip and they're only about eight or nine minute clips on the Chicago Fire website. You can go check them out. Uh, Suke started off uh, being asked how difficult it is to score against this Red Bull team. And the first thing he said is he pointed out their, the differences in the style of play, that the Fire and the Red Bulls play a very, very different style of play. And at first I was like, well, you have to have a style of play if you're going to compare it to another team. So I guess they're coaching, they're trying to coach some sort of style of play with Suke and, and the Chicago Fire. I don't know if it's actually coming through on game day, but he does note how differently they play. Uh, and that is something that we're going to have to look at. Typically, I shouldn't say typically, the old adage, it's the old rock, paper, scissors adage, where a, you know, rock beats scissors, scissor cuts paper, paper covers rock. You have the pressing team will beat the possession team, the possession team will beat the counterattacking team, and the counterattacking team will beat the pressing team, right? That's kind of the, the rotation there. So maybe the Chicago Fire are going to try to play uh, this counterattacking style. Or now, so maybe that's something we're going to see a little bit more. But we know the Fire are a counterattacking team. But Suke even points out how they have changed their their system, their defensive system, and how they cannot play the long ball all the time here. So he, he said that the staff wanted to change the system throughout the course of the season a couple times. Beginning of the season, they start with a four-man back line. They switched to a five-man in the back system, and now they're trying to tweak that a little bit. He even said as a right back, they've had to move him around because they want maybe a, a faster player on the outside of the right. So that's why they shifted to that five-back system where he can play like right center back. But he also said that he thinks his strength is his passing and he can kind of start at the attack from the back. I haven't seen it. Definitely didn't see it last week. But that's something that he thinks about himself, that he is a, an above average passer and can start the attack from the back. He did say, speaking of tactics and speaking of, you know, counterattacking, beating, counterpressing, uh, they can't play the long ball all the time. Uh, he said, we need to create something like the second half against DC. So it seems to me that the Fire are going to want to hold the ball up a little bit despite the conventional wisdom of a counter high high powered counter pressing team is going to beat a team that that wants to hold possession. So that is going to be a very difficult thing to overcome if that is what the Fire are trying to do. This would be the game where I would be okay with a bit of a track meet and the Chicago Fire playing a lot of direct balls through to Kuipers, to Haile Selassie, to Kutsias if he's there, to Gutierrez if he stays in a more forward and advanced midfield position. But overall, the final comment says it all here. Suke says, I think we can beat this team. So they're going in with the confidence whether it's confidence in themselves or confidence in whatever game plan the coaching staff has come up with, they think they can beat this team. Now, looking at Frank Klopas's comments, I'm not going to rehash everything because uh, from his like nine minute clip, eight minutes was just typical Klopas. We need to come out with intensity and energy and, and play for the club and represent the city. You know, and even though there's no relegation, there's still a lot of pressure on these players to perform. Nothing tactically. Nothing uh, about what he wants to see more from certain players and, 
and how you know not, i'm not calling them out but just saying hey I, I need to see more from gutierrez i need him to be confident and assertive and i need him to find make be better in the final third and make decisions nope nothing like that uh nothing to address the red bull style of play and what he expects out of them or what players he's got to watch out for you know last week he said it bent it's benteke we got to stop benteke and they didn't do it so maybe that's why he didn't say anything about that this week or maybe just they're not worried about red bull they're trying to play their own game uh, but he didn't even say that. So I'm not going to rehash the general, maybe I did just rehash his general comments, uh, but it's nothing that we haven't heard from Klopas a dozen times before this year. He did say that Ari Lasseter and Jorgos Kutsias will be available for selection. I doubt they will start just based on Klopas saying uh, Lasseter came in on Wednesday, or Tuesday or Wednesday, Kutsias came in on Wednesday. So they're going to be evaluated for their fitness, how they're feeling, how the jet lag is going to be. Uh, but both of those players did score on international duty. Lasseter gets a goal for the Costa Rican senior team. Kutsias gets a goal for the Greece U21 team. Uh, and Klopas had a lot to say about Kutsias in his presser, about how he thinks he is developing into a very good striker, that the league's cup minutes really helped him find some confidence. And there's you're starting to see him as a striker who is always moving and active and in the right spot in the box. That's what I got out of this little uh, presser with Klopas. I want to end my little Klopas comments here with a message I received from Tom in Geneva, who emailed me about Klopas, among other things, but emailed me about Klopas saying that he too noticed Klopas' lack of engagement in the DC game. I said it in the last episode. I, I was sitting 12 rows behind where Klopas was standing in Bridgeview, and he just was a statue. So Tom continued and says, I noticed his lack of engagement, and I know from experience that when it's missing drastic intervention, uh, when that engagement is missing, drastic intervention must happen. Sorry, Tom, I'm misreading your words here. If your employee has skill but isn't engaged, you try to work with him to solve the problem. If there is a lack of skill, you work with them to find an appropriate position for them, sometimes in another company or team. I think with Frank, it is a lack of skill, sadly. So good insight from Tom there and absolutely something uh, that I have been trained up. I think it's a little bit more of a modern philosophy where you identify good workers, you identify people who have the certain soft skills that you're looking for and then you can train them into a, a right position find out where their skill set fits so if you've got someone who's hardworking, who's dynamic who's friendly good customer service uh someone who or depending on another position that they're intelligent they come from uh, a great academic background you bring them into your company and you watch them for the first six months or so and you say okay what are they doing well how where can i funnel them into more specialized positions so the fire did that they brought in klopas like this guy loves the fire he's been around the game he's good with the players seems to be good with the fans front office awesome that's great now where can we put him they keep putting the round peg in a square hole or vice versa maybe depending on the size of the square <laughs> the round peg fits they keep putting the square peg in the round hole by putting him on the sideline on the bench as a coach no he's got all these wonderful wonderful soft skills but the tactical skills and coaching acumen aren't there and yet that's where the fire keeps sticking him so here the corporate analogy I think is appropriate it might not always be appropriate in professional sports but here it absolutely is and thanks tom for making that connection for me also thank you to joe chats of ontap sportsnet tim hots from men in red 97 media and jim alexander from real talker for being at the media uh day and getting their questions in and helping us get a little of that content from the chicago fire so all of that being said i will give my quick prediction I think this is a Red Bull victory, and it's going to be at least 2-1 Red Bull, more likely 3-1 Red Bull, if they can get their full complement of players uh, back on the bench and on the pitch. But, as my daughter said uh, to me as she's reading one of her fictional stories about a little girl who finds a magic bracelet, she looks at me and says, Baba, if I had a magic bracelet, I would wish the fire would win. And that's why she's coming to the game with me this weekend.
So the boys are staying home with mom, and it's my daughter and I at the, the match this Saturday at Soldier Field. So if you're out there, if you're out in Section 205 or tailgating, be on the lookout for me. Come say hi. Always great to, to shake hands and, and put uh, names to faces and, and meet some of the listeners of the show. Now let's take a look at a few other headlines from around the league. Uh, notably, the MLS Players Association put out their free agent list, and there are four free agents on the Chicago Fire. Let me pull it up here in front of me. So we have Fabian Herbers, who's listed as a right wing and is out of contract. Ariel Lassiter, listed as a left wing and is out of contract. Wyatt Olmsberg, center back, out of contract. And Spencer Ritchie, goalkeeper, out of contract. Now I looked at these four players and I'm thinking, if I'm the Chicago Fire going into next season, who would I want? And if I'm the Chicago Fire and I think I'm going to contend for a trophy in two, three, or four seasons, who do I still want? And none of these names jumped off the page when it came to the trophy consideration. But when it came to who do I want on the team next year, number one, Wyatt Olmsberg, a smart and competent center back on a team that is going to have to rebuild their back line. And Ariel Lassiter, who is an MLS vet who can work with whatever new wingers they're going to bring in or provide some depth when it comes to Leagues Cup, US Open, Open Cup, whatever else the Chicago Fire are playing in. So for next season, I would like to see Lassiter and Olmsberg back. And if you've been listening to the show, you know that these are two players that I just like in general, not to mention their, their skill set. Uh, I, I just think these are two players that, that I've gravitated to in watching their game and how they conduct themselves. So uh, there's that, but I do think they serve a useful role in uh, the organization. Fabian Herbers, to me, took a huge step back this season. I don't think he is ever going to recover. I think he is regressing, and I think the end of his career is here. I'm not saying he's going to retire. I'm not saying it's the end, but I'm saying he's going into that final phase where he's only going to get maybe one more contract or so, uh, or have to go play at a lower level someplace, maybe go back to Germany, play in a second or third division, something like that. Uh, but we've always said on this show that Herbers is not a piece of a trophy, like not a main piece of a trophy winning team. He is a good depth piece on a team that's competing for playoffs and potentially a trophy. But the fire aren't there, and I doubt they're going to be there next year, so they're better off letting Herbers go and bringing up some younger pieces to develop. Also along those lines, Spencer Ritchie is a goalkeeper, and I have the greatest amount of respect for goalkeepers. I keep trying to get my sons to, at this stage in their career, practice some goalkeeping skills. You know, they when they're young like this, you can't pigeonhole kids into a position because who knows when their growth spurt's going to hit? Who knows if uh, or, or if it's ever going to hit? I don't, I'm still waiting for mine. That's why I never could play center back, uh, even in my younger days. I was definitely not big enough. Uh, you never know how the kid's body is going to change. You never know how their skills are going to develop and who's going to develop around them. So you cannot pigeonhole a kid into a certain role at this phase in their life, I think, or at least for my kids who are elementary school age. So I keep trying to tell them, play keeper. It's great to have a keeper skill set. Or if the co if you're ever on a team and someone's like, I need a goalie, I can do it, coach. I'm willing to do it. Uh, and I saw a great video by uh, someone on social media, Coach Christos McGinnis, who says, you know, tell the coach. The coach says, what position do you play? Don't say, whatever you want, coach, because that's not helping him make his decision. Don't say, I'm only a striker, because that takes you out of a lot of conversation. But if you're a player who can say, hey, I'm, I'm an attacking-minded player. I can play centrally or out on the wing. Uh, I've also played goalie in the past. Like That is the perfect answer as this uh, former player, now kind of private coach, online teacher, uh, Coach Cristo, said. So it also helps he's Greek that I listen to him a little bit. Uh, so I, that's what I'm trying to teach my kids and as, and as much as it would be great to have Spencer Ritchie, a competent MLS, possibly starting caliber goalkeeper for some clubs, the Chicago Fire are stacked with keepers. Brady, so far we haven't heard any rumors about his transfer. At this point, I think he's the starter for next season. You've still got Jeff Gall. You still have Brian Dowd, their draft pick from this year, who's been playing with Nashville's uh, MLS Next Pro team. You've probably got a, a keeper in the academy who could slot in to a 
uh, third spot goalkeeper if needed and maybe get some training with the first team as well. So I just think Spencer Ritchie is a victim of the Chicago Fire's goalkeeping pipeline. I don't expect to see him back. So th those are my thoughts on the Chicago Fire's four players on the MLS PA free agent list for this upcoming offseason. There are a lot of defenders on this list throughout the league, a lot of center backs that would be really interesting to see if the Chicago Fire can get them on a friendly contract to come in and help rebuild uh, their, their defensive line. The old adage is uh, you go out and spend big on offense and you find defense at home, whether that's the academy or within the league. So here, if you're looking at some center backs who you probably have heard of, MLS fans, Matt Hedges for Austin, uh, Miles Robinson currently with Cincinnati, as well as Nick Haglund with Cincinnati. Uh, who else center back? Kosi Tafari with Dallas. He's having a pretty good year. He could be a player that develops, though he is on an option, and I'm not sure that uh, Dallas is willing to let him go. Uh, what other center backs are jumping off this list? They posted it as a PDF, so I can't sort it, and I can't copy and put it into a spreadsheet to sort as well. So thanks a lot, MLSPA. You make it sortable. Let, let us have some use if you don't want to share the actual document with us here. Um, other center backs, Daniel Steris, Houston Dyna Dynamo, Eddie Segura, LAFC. Now, a lot, again, a lot of these guys are on options, like the last two I just mentioned. Uh, but Michael Boxall, Hassani Dotson. Uh, Boxall is out of contract. He might be a good pickup for the fire or someone to be considered. Um, who else on the center back list? Jonathan Mensah, Tim Parker. But here's the thing. All these center backs I'm naming are, are competent MLS backs. But all of them have been around a very long time. And I don't know if the, the way the attacking talent in this league is going, if the Chicago Fire want to be bringing in these older players for starting roles. Depth pieces, maybe a one or two year contract. If that is their plan, I wouldn't be as opposed to it. Uh, but if they're thinking these are the guys we're going to bring in to start, I don't think that's that's a good plan at all. By the way, they still have three guys listed in the MLS pool. Luis Martins, Chris Mavinga, and Josie Altidore still technically has... Uh, has some availability, I guess, for for MLS here. It says he's out of contract. I guess TFC's finally done paying paying him off. Uh, so go take a look at MLSPA, or here's the website, MLSplayers.org, and go check out that free agent list. Tell me if there's any names that, that you would want to see. Uh, any any position. Keeper, striker, winger. They, they've organized it um, pretty well by position here, and who is pending an option or out of contract altogether. But that's kind of my my take on the free agents. One last thought before we wrap here. US MNT news. The US drew New Zealand 1-1. Uh, while I didn't watch the game, most of the analysis I saw analysis that I saw, excuse me, tongue twister, uh, was that the US right now is Christian Pulisic and 10 other guys. Uh, and by that, I don't mean he's doing everything, even though he did get the goal against New Zealand and is the primary offensive option for this team. But he's the one guy who is a locked-in starter as of today. And the other 10 positions are up for grabs, especially under new coach, formerly announced, Mauricio Pochettino. So with that, fans, I want to thank you for tuning in and listening. I hope to see you all at the match this Saturday. Hopefully the Chicago Fire can get a win. I'm going to cheer with my heart though I make predictions with my head. Thank you so much for tuning in, listening, viewing, liking, subscribing, rating, reviewing. Anything helps drive up our social media online algorithm push uh, to kind of get the news out about the show, Major League Soccer and the Chicago Fire. And as always, let's go fire.